The Bible says that the universe was created with words. Get the word in you. Get the word out of you. Do the word. New words make a new person. New words get new results. I cannot tell you, I've been teaching this for years. The more I teach it, the more I see it's true. I see it in every person in this church. Your thinking, your words, it is your future. Your future does not come to you. Your future comes from you. Today we're gonna to talk about this command, and yes, it's a command from Jesus to do greater things than he did. Not only can we do greater things, he commands us to do it, and the scripture gives us two ways that we can do that. And we're gonna talk about that later in this message. I believe that if you watch this whole message or listen to this whole thing, you'll know these two things and you'll be doing greater things than Jesus, which is saying something. Funny story, kid was scared at night. There was a big storm coming through, it was loud, thunder coming down. Dad comes in to pray with him, prays with him, and the son says, where are you going? He said, don't worry, I've prayed with you. God's here in your room, he's not gonna leave you. The son says, Dad, don't go anywhere. And he says, son, don't worry about it. God's going to be here. He's with you. And the boy says, I want a God with some skin on him. <laughs> How many of you know we serve a God with some skin on him? How many of you know this is what Israel was crying out for for all those years? A God with some skin. His name is Jesus Christ. God with some skin on him. And, and theologically, we refer to this God with some skin on him. We refer to it as incarnation. Incarnation, which is a Latin word. Anybody here speak Spanish? What does carne mean? Meat. Meat, yeah. Thank you, Fernando. Carne. If you want a burrito with some carne on it, right? And you're asking for a little extra, I don't know, bacon or something. So this is what incarnation means. It means to put meat on something, to put flesh on something, to put skin on something. So theologically, when we talk about the incarnation, we're talking about what happens in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became what? Flesh? Right? So this is, this is what we're talking about, but it's not limited to that. Incarnation theologically also means that we put skin on God. Now, I want to be careful here. You're not God in your baptism. You don't become a God. You don't become divine. You're still a creation. But it's important to recognize that God's presence takes on flesh and baptize believers who are full of the Holy Spirit. It is an orthodox belief that Jesus is literally in the bodies of many people in this room right now. That when those people pray for me, Jesus is also praying for me. When those people lay hands on me for my sickness, Jesus is laying hands on me in the flesh. It's not just something that we say in nursery rhymes. When we say Christ is in us, it's literally two people are praying for me when you pray for me if you're a believer. You and Christ. You see? Here's what discipleship is in basic terms. It's learning and copying Jesus. One of the most fundamental, most important questions you can ask in your life is what would Christ do if he were in my shoes literally? One of the most important questions I can ask when I wake up in the morning is, what would a 42-year-old American man who's married and has two children, who's a pastor of a church in Irvine, what would he act like and do today? And copy that image to the best of my ability. That's what discipleship is, okay? So, uh, toward that end, we want to begin asking, how do I live in that life? How do I attain that kind of life? How do I become a new kind of person through discipleship? And that brings us to Acts chapter 3. Hannah read a part of it this morning. I'm going to read the early part. If you have your Bibles, Acts chapter 3, verse 1, it says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. Everybody say every day. This is going to be an important point later, okay? Every day. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John, and Peter said, look at us. So the man, you know, looked at them, gave him his attention, expecting to get what? Some cheddar, right? Get a little dough, get some money. Yeah. Expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, famously, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. 
Taking him up by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Let me tell you something that is crazy about this passage, something that almost everybody misses. In the timeline of this story, just a few weeks early, something else really important happened at the gate called Beautiful. It happened on Palm Sunday. Jesus is on a donkey. He's coming into town. Everybody's shouting Hosanna. I think everybody thinks he's going to go to see a pilot at the Antonia Fortress, but instead he goes where? To what? To the temple? And if you might remember, the main entrance to the temple is on the southern side. In this case, Jesus. But there, there's this, this area where these steps go up on the southern side of the temple. First you go to the mikvah, you wash, you ascend, and everybody goes into this gate. And that's the main entrance that everybody would go to worship. That gate is the gate beautiful. That's where the money changers are. That's where this guy is begging for money. So we know the story that Jesus goes into the temple. He goes to where the money changers are at the gate beautiful. Clears them out, right? Whips them. Does a little bit of shouting, right? They all enter. That's the first thing he does. Then what? Then he just starts healing people like crazy. Where? Where's he healing people, guys? Come on. At the gate, beautiful. Okay, so that begs. So here's Jesus. He's healing all these people at the beautiful gate. Now the Bible says this guy was there every day. He'd been there for years, 30 years, 40 years. Been there begging for money every single day. He, was pro- he had to be there. If, it, if every day means every day, he was there the day Jesus was healing people and he didn't get healed. Here's the question. Why? Why didn't Jesus heal that guy? Why not? And the answer was, it was preordained by God that Peter and John would do it for a purpose. For a purpose. When Jesus was healing on Palm Sunday, he'd not been crucified, there'd not been a resurrection, Salvation had not been made available to anybody. On the day that Peter and John raised this guy from the dead, the the scriptures goes on to say that 5,000 people came to know the Lord Jesus Christ and were saved. So why? It was Peter and John's job. We can say that Jesus did heal him. He just took a few extra weeks, right? Three people healed that guy. It was Peter, John, and Jesus, right? Jesus was in them. Jesus was literally present in the flesh of Peter and John. Well, it's easy for us to say, of course, Jesus was in the flesh in Peter and John. They're special. They're not. They're not more special than you and me. In the same way that the Holy Spirit was in Peter, he's in you. And half of understanding the sermon today is getting that point along, that that you're putting skin on. Christ is present in you. He's in you right now. So faith is understanding that and acting like that. Let's believe it, amen? Amen. Okay, so if we want to live a greater things kind of life, here's the two things I believe that every believer ought to do every day to get greater and greater and greater things every day. Number one, it's so obvious. If you listen to my sermons, you know what I'm going to say. Get the word inside of you. The word, the word of God, the Bible. Jesus is the word of God. This is the word of God. The words of the Lord. The Bible, when the Bible is read, God's voice is heard. When the Bible is read aloud, God's voice is heard audibly. These are the words of life. This is the gospel. This is salvation. This is truth. This is the key. This is wisdom. This is life. This is bread. It starts with faith. So we got to get it in there. We got to get it in there. And we get it through faith. We know how to get faith. We know how to get faith. We don't get faith through worshiping, but we love worship. We don't get faith through prayer, but we love praying. We don't get faith even by asking for it. We don't get faith by hoping that we'll get faith. We don't get faith by searching for faith. Here's how you get faith. Faith comes by what? Hearing, and hearing comes by what? The Word of God, which is both Jesus and the Bible. Faith comes by by words, by the word of God. God's word is bread. 
This is bread. It's bread. You eat it every day. It nourishes you. It tastes good. Get the word of God inside of you. The Bible says that the, that the universe was created with words. In the beginning was the word, right? We just said that. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Let me ask you a question. What if that's true? What if that's true, that the universe was created with words? That would be an important thing to know. Now, for the ancients, the idea of the universe being created with words was very hard to fathom. But on rare, this is one of those rare occasions where, for us, I feel like in our modern world, that's very easy to grasp. We call it coding. Now, we're making all sorts of things with coding. One of the most valuable assets in the world is a, is a coding software called Facebook. All it is is a bunch of code. How much is that worth? Billions and billions of dollars. Video games and movies are using words to create whole universes that even 20 years ago we never thought we would ever see. Wow, through what? Through words, words, coding, coding. And just like a computer, we, we take up these words inside of us and it creates our own kind of software and our own kind of universe and our own kind of experience. Here's a great question. The words in your life are creating a philosophy and a way of thinking that direct your life. Here's the good question. Where are my thoughts taking me? That's a good question. Where are my thoughts taking me? Everything you have in life is the result of the person you've become. And the person you've become is the result of your thinking. Where are my thoughts taking me? Get new words. Get new thoughts. Get a new philosophy if you want a new life. Hundred miles or a few hundred miles up the road, a little town called Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Google. Even here in Irvine, we have many software companies. Blizzard is just up the road here. Here's something that they say at software companies when it comes to coding. Garbage in, garbage out. When you're coding, when you're writing, garbage in, garbage out. If you hurry, if you do bad words in, you're gonna get bad stuff coming out of that program. It's the same with life. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. If you get good words, if you get great words inside of you, you're gonna get greatness coming out of your life. If you get good words inside of you, you're gonna get greatness coming out of your life. Famous story, Solomon, presented with the throne of God. God is there in all of his glory. And says to Solomon, ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And famously, we know what Solomon asked for. Now, everybody always gets this question wrong. What did Solomon ask for? Say it aloud. What did Solomon ask for? <laughs> wrong. Uh, it's 50% it's right. He asked for two things. Wisdom and knowledge. Two things, wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge, it's not the same thing. Wisdom is what happens when you practice stuff, when you do stuff. Wisdom comes with age for a reason. Wisdom comes from experience. Knowledge comes from learning, it comes from reading and other things like that. Wisdom and knowledge. And God says to him famously, because you didn't ask for the death of your enemies, you didn't ask for money, you didn't ask for honor, you didn't ask for this and that, I'm going to give you not only wisdom and knowledge, unlike anyone's ever seen, you're going to get all that other stuff too. So what does that say? Wisdom and knowledge. Words, the words. New words make a new person. New words get new results. I cannot tell you, I've been teaching this for years. The more I teach it, the more I see it's true. I see it in every person in this church. I know it with all of my friends. I know it with the people I work with. Philosophy, your thinking, your words, it is your future. Your future does not come to you. Your future comes from you. It comes from the person you've become. And becoming a new person comes from getting a new idea, a new philosophy. I told Haven not that long ago, I said, if I had to be locked up in prison, I think I could make it if you just gave me two things. You need this thing right here, and I need, I, don't, I forgot it, both services. A yellow legal pad. I am a huge fan of the yellow legal pad. 
Why? Because, as it's famously said, you don't just learn to write, you write to learn. When you write things out, there's something about that process that helps you develop as a person. Here's something you can do. Take an hour, get, get the grandparents to watch the kids or whatever it is, take a break from work, take at least an hour, go somewhere, turn your phone off, take a legal pad, push through the first 10 minutes of boredom, go somewhere really peaceful, and write down what, your, what, life, what you want your life to become like. If you were to rub a lamp and a genie were to come out and he said, hi, I'm a genie, but I only give you one, one wish, and here's the caveat, you only get your wish in five years from now. So you gotta ask now, and then five years you're gonna get it. What would you write down? That's a good question. If you're full of God's spirit, if you're full of God's life, you're gonna get a good answer to that, to that question. Write it down and begin to write down what you wanna change in your life and what you wanna experience and what you want your life to look like. And then you'll have a reason to grow. Okay, so the first thing for greater things in life, get the word in you. The second thing, get the word out of you. Do the word, practice the word, put it into practice. This is hard in the West. We think learning is enough, it's not. You've gotta to do to really learn. Peter and John had to ask the man to rise up and walk. Why is it that faith and it is always associated with action? It's always, almost always, faith means that you do something. Peter didn't believe he could walk on water until he got out of the boat. Why is it that Jesus asked the blind man to wipe the mud from his eyes? Why didn't he just heal him? Why is it they asked the lepers to go and show themselves to the priest? Why didn't he just heal them? And they, the reason is in all of these cases, I believe, maybe he's not sure they believe. Woman, your faith has made you well, the scripture says. Your faith. And what was her faith? It was reaching out and touching Christ, even though that was embarrassing. You see, it is the action, it is the action that shows. Link your words with action. Here in the West, we have a major problem referred to as the knowing-doing gap. We think if we learn something that all of a sudden we know it or we understand it. A guy at a university gets an A in ethics and then later murders somebody. We see no problem with that. If you got an A in ethics, shouldn't you not murder people because of the, what you learned? No, no, we, he learned it here, that's enough. He got an A on his exam, you see? Problem, that's no, 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 no. Not in this church. Learning, here's what learning is. Learning, and I heard this from a friend of mine, is a rate of behavior change. If you can hear everything in this sermon, and you can go out to your friends and you can recite every line of this sermon word for word, but nothing changes in your life. You've not learned anything, you see? Learning means something changed in your action, what you do, do the word. I have uh, four sisters and a mom and a stepmom. I have a lot of women in my life. And I, I noticed a long time ago, there's this, I think all four of my sisters are here. I should probably not say this, but it's too late. I noticed that <laughs> women, when they go through a change in life, they always change their hair. I don't know if that, like, it's like my sister comes home and her hair is short and it's a different color. I'm like, oh my gosh, what happened to her? Oh no, is this a good one or a bad one, you know? But that's how we are as human beings. We like to symbolize a change in our life with some kind of outside action, with some kind of, some kind of something. And I think that's fine. Sometimes it's, it's actually good to burn the ships. Sometimes it's good to just burn the ships to the ground and say, I'm not going back. Symbolically, literally, to say, I'm just not going back. I've decided on this road and that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do, do, do. That's what Elisha did. When Elijah called Elisha, what does he do? He takes all of his wealth, which is all of his cattle and his plow, and what's he do? He slaughters every, every uh, steer, or ox, I think it was, slaughters every ox, chops up all of his equipment, which was made of wood, has a huge barbecue, and serves the meat to all of his neighbors. What's he saying? I'm not coming back. I have nothing to come back to. You see, I'm taking action, I'm gonna follow the prophet, and I'm gonna become a new, a new guy, a new creation. So all I'm saying, my friend, is take action, execute, execute. Do something, just go for it. Do something different in your life. 
Many of you who are watching on uh, YouTube or on television, you grew up in the 80s as I did. If you're watching YouTube, please subscribe. <laughs> I want to get that up to 100 grand. That's my dream. If you grew up in the 80s, I still remember 1987 opening this new beautiful box I got for Christmas at my Grandpa Pursley's house, and it was called a Nintendo Entertainment System. And I remember sitting with my grandpa, reading through this nine-page manual, line by line. Super Mario Brothers, and we're reading through the manual. You know, to jump, you press A, to do, you go forward, right? And I still remember, then you put the game in, and it's like, you start the game, you're like, okay, to jump, like, th that was the last video game manual I've ever read in my life. <laughs> right, here's how you learn how to play a video game. You stick the game in and you play it. It reveals itself. It reveals itself. Here's when you read the manual. You read the manual and you get stuck. So you do, and then you come back to the manual to fix what's wrong. Never forget that God's commands to us are for our benefit. He gives us his commands because he loves us. The fourth command in the Ten Commandments, for those of you who are super students, who knows the fourth of the Ten Commandments? You all know it. I'll say it. I'll start it, and then you'll know the rest. It goes like this. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, that's not the end of the commandment. Here's the full commandment. Thou shalt work six days, and on the seventh day you shall rest. In the modern world, when we hear this command, we say, bummer. And we say, that is not a good command, all right? But here's why God had to give them that command, is because they loved their work. If you loved your work, you need to be ordered to stop one day a week. And by the way, the command isn't to just stop. It is to work six days a week. We are called, why? Because when we work, work is a good word. It means we're doing something with our hands. It means we're making something. It means we're adding value. Adding value to the family, adding value to the community, adding value to the country, adding value to the church, adding value to the market. When we make things with our hands, we're adding value. And the work works on you more than you work on it. Work maketh a man. It does. And that's why this commandment is a blessing to us. And the reason it sounds like a curse to a lot of people today is because when we're working, we're not really working when we're resting, we're not really resting. When you're at work, you're kind of like, you get there on time only because you have to, and then you're kind of like, you know, half into it, and then you're kind of like checking your phone, and you're kind of like talking to people at the Waterdale, and you maybe you leave a little bit early, and you're not into it. And then when you're, so you're not really working. You're not really creating value. And then when you go to rest, you're not really resting. You're kind of like on your phone for hours, and then you're watching like more TV than you thought you would. You kind of hope to just watch like one show, but then you watch the whole thing on Netflix, and it's not very good, and you're like, where's my Saturday gun, right? So you're not really resting. If we really work, and we really rest, we'll be in God's rhythm. His rhythm is easy rhythm of grace, and we'll be blessed. So when you work, work. When you rest, rest. Here's a good phrase. Whatever you do, do it with all your might. Do it with all your might. If you're going to do something, do it. Make it great. Do the best you can. Give it all you've got. And this is true, especially of doing the word. I saw somebody earlier in the alcove praying for someone. Thank you, Lord, that we have a church that prays for one another. Thank you, Lord. Here's what the world has to offer for somebody that's going through a hard time, sympathy. Here's what you have to offer because you put skin on God, prayer. Yes, we want to empathize with people, that goes, but man, can I tell you, I've prayed for atheists and every religion and every type of person. I always ask people, not always, I like to ask people to pray with them, but when I do, people are touched. I know I said this, I probably said this a couple weeks ago, but pray for people. Share your faith with people. Invite people to church. Give to people in need. Do the word. Do the word. Believe that God will heal people when you pray for them. Don't pray faithless prayers. Pray prayers full of faith. And become all that you can be. And do all that you can do for God's kingdom. Don't get through things. Get from things. Don't get through this week. Get from this week. Get from every meal. 
Get, fr you get from every moment with the people you love. Get from every experience. Don't get through things. Don't get through the church service. Get from the service. Don't get through work. Get from work. Don't get through the day. Get from the day. There's so much that's available to you and to me. Last thing I want to say, I just want to encourage you to live at peace with God. There's no reason to not be at peace with God. Jesus Christ laid his life down on the cross and was raised from the dead that we could be saved. There's no reason to not receive that free gift. Won't you make a decision to follow Jesus Christ? Do that and you will be saved. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together. Father, we're going to believe that today is going to be a new day. We're believing that we can be a new creation in you. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you that you're here. And we thank you that you're in us. And we love you. It's in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Thank you for watching Hour of Power on YouTube. We hope this message encourages you. Like and subscribe below for more encouraging content.